Let's start talking about what managerial accounting is and what it can do for the firm. In part one of chapter 16, we'll be talking about the differences between financial accounting and managerial accounting. You've already taken financial accounting, so let's start by reviewing how financial accounting works. Financial accounting is designed to meet the information needs of external users, that is, people who are outside of the firm. That would include investors, people who might want to buy or sell shares of the firm's stock, creditors, that is, people who might want to lend money to the firm or extend credit, financial analysts who make a living by offering their opinions to investors and creditors, and various regulatory agencies like the Internal Revenue Service, or the Securities and Exchange Commission that need to know how the firm is doing. So the goal of financial accounting is to give these external users information that will help them to make their investment or credit decisions. In order to provide information that will be useful to external users, financial accounting needs to focus on two key issues. One issue is relevance, which means that financial accounting information should make a difference to external users' decisions. In other words, they don't want to be bothered with information that doesn't make any difference to their decisions. The other issue is that financial accounting should be what's called a faithful representation of what actually happened in the firm during the period. In other words, it should include all of the information that it should have, but not any information that it shouldn't have. Financial accounting doesn't allow a firm to guess about the future. Instead, it focuses on the past, on things that have already happened, because we believe that knowing something about what happened in the recent past will give investors and creditors some idea of what's likely to happen in the future. To make sure that financial accounting gives external users information that is relevant for their decisions and is a faithful representation of what actually happened in the firm, during the period, financial accounting has a lot of rules. In the United States, these rules are called GAAP, which stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. For firms that are based outside of the United States, the rules are called IFRS, which stands for international financial reporting standards. In addition, after a series of catastrophic accounting scandals, the U.S. Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002 in order to improve firms' financial accounting and reporting systems and to improve firms' corporate governance. It's the auditor's job to gather information to make sure that the firm 
followed all of these rules so that external users have some reasonable assurance that the story that they see in the financial statements is a reasonable reflection of what actually happened in the firm during the period. The scope of financial reporting is very broad. A huge diversified firm can summarize its operations on just four sheets of paper, an income statement, a statement of changes in stockholders' equities, a balance sheet, and a statement of cash flows. But that means that they don't give a lot of details about specific characteristics of various parts of firm operations. And they're not published very often. Quarterly, for publicly traded firms, annually for firms that are not publicly traded. We do have some concerns when it comes to financial reporting. One issue is the adequacy of disclosures. If you remember back to your financial accounting class, you might recall that the full disclosure principle says that firms have to tell users of financial statements everything that they need to know in order to understand the numbers that they see on the face of the financial statements. But do they? We can see the disclosures that are presented but we have no way of knowing if anything was left out. The other problem is agency issues that exist between managers and investors or creditors. Agency issues occur when different parties want different things. In this case, the investors and creditors want the managers to make money for them. But is that what the managers want? Probably not. They want to make money for themselves. So we're concerned that the managers might make decisions that advantage themselves and disadvantage the investors and creditors. Now let's talk about how managerial accounting differs from financial accounting. The first difference is who gets to use the information. Managerial accounting information is prepared to meet the needs of people who actually work for the firm. It's not available to external users like investors and creditors, although some managerial accounting information does filter down to the external financial statements. The internal users of managerial accounting information include the firm's managers who make decisions and the firm's employees who carry out those decisions. The goals of managerial accounting also differ from financial accounting. They include planning, which means deciding on what the firm is going to try to accomplish and developing strategies for accomplishing it and control, which means evaluating the results of the firm's operations to determine whether the strategies worked and whether the goals were achieved. Like financial accounting, 
one focus of managerial accounting is on relevance. That is, managers only need to see information that's relevant to the decisions that they make. They don't need irrelevant information in that moment. But the other focus of managerial accounting is timeliness. In other words, managers need to have the information that they need in time to make a difference to their decisions. Because of that, managerial accounting relies far more on estimates or future-oriented information than financial accounting does. Speaking of the future, the time frame for managerial accounting focuses much more on what's happening in the present and what's likely to happen in the future than financial accounting is allowed to do. The rules for managerial accounting also differ from financial accounting. Specifically, managerial accounting does not have to follow GAAP. Instead, the key issue is to provide information that will be useful to managers when they make their next decisions. Although managerial accounting information will be put on a GAAP basis as it flows onto the financial statements. Remember that the scope of financial accounting is reports that cover the entire firm so they are highly aggregated and they don't come out very often, maybe quarterly or annually. But that won't work for managerial accounting. Different managers need reports on specific components of the firm. So, for example, the marketing manager needs to know the costs and the effectiveness of the most recent sales campaign. And the production manager needs to know about any changes in the consumption or the price of raw materials. And managers can't wait until the end of the quarter or the end of the year to get this information. They need it on a daily or weekly basis. In fact, manager's favorite question is usually, how are we doing? How did we do today? How are we doing this week? Of course, we do have some behavioral concerns about managerial accounting. One issue is that managers are going to make decisions based on the managerial accounting information that is available to them. So we want to make sure that this information is going to help them to make the optimal decisions. Another problem is the agency issue that exists between managers and their bosses. The bosses need to know what's going on and whether the firm is moving toward achieving its goals, whereas the managers may prefer to present information that makes them look good. A firm's stakeholders include any individuals, groups, or organizations that are affected by the decisions that the firm makes. So we need to be concerned about the possibility that the firm's managers 
will make decisions that advantage themselves and their firm rather than other stakeholders. For example, by dumping toxic waste in the river or making substandard products. Based on the material that we've covered so far, here's a question for you to think about. Which of these is not a characteristic of managerial accounting? Think about it for a minute and decide which answer you would choose if this was, say, a test question. You can right-click your mouse and then left-click on pause if you need more time to think about it. The right answer can't be D because managerial accounting does focus on the future. And it can't be C because managerial accounting does emphasize relevance as well as timeliness. And it can't be B because managerial accounting does give details about various parts of the firm. If you chose answer A, that's the correct answer. While managerial accounting information does filter down to the financial statements, its primary focus is internal reports, not external financial statements. Here are my five basic rules for how managerial accounting works. I'll point out applications of these rules as we talk about various managerial accounting issues during the semester. The first rule is that all costs have to go somewhere from an external financial reporting viewpoint. This means that all costs have to end up either on the balance sheet or on the income statement. Costs go to the income statement when they have fulfilled their destiny of helping the firm to generate revenues and they stay on the balance sheet if they're not done helping the firm to generate revenues yet. Internally, this rule means that a particular cost might be attached to product A or it might be attached to product B or it might be attached to department C or it might be attached to Department D. The point is that in all of these cases, it's not possible to have a cost that's not attached to something that the firm does. The second rule is that you can't control costs that you can't see. Therefore, a lot of work that we do in managerial accounting is designed to make costs visible so that managers can make smart managerial decisions about what to do with those costs and whether they continue to make sense for the firm. The third rule for managerial accounting is that costs advise us, but they don't rule us. For example, if you go to a restaurant, you don't have to order the least expensive thing on the menu. You might choose to, but you don't have to. You might decide that you want something else and that the price charged is 
worth it. The same thing is true in managerial accounting. Managers don't have to do the cheapest thing possible. If that were the rule, then managers should fire all their employees, turn off the lights, and sell their property. They don't do that because they believe that staying open and operating is worth it. The next rule is that decisions are only as good as the information and the skills used to make them. In other words, you can't make the smart decision unless you have reliable information and you have appropriate skills to be able to identify what the smart decision is. This is one of the reasons that Rutgers requires managerial accounting for all business majors. The last rule for managerial accounting is that we are what we are rewarded to be. So you have to be very careful what you reward since that's what you're going to get. For example, let's say that you reward people for getting their work done faster. In that case, your subordinates will work hard to get things done quickly, but you may be surprised at the number of errors that they make. I also want to offer you a few rules related to business and life in general. The first rule is don't make your problems into the boss's problems. Believe me, the boss won't like it. When you graduate from Rutgers, you hope to get a terrific job with a terrific salary, but that's not going to happen unless the firm believes that you're going to solve some of their problems, not create new ones. The second rule is no one ever left a job because they couldn't stand being so happy. Someday, you're going to be a manager, and that means you're going to have subordinates. It's your responsibility to make sure that your subordinates are happy with the work that they do and happy with the salary that they receive, so they'll want to stay with the organization and continue to be useful. Finally, school is the only business that I can think of where customers actually want less for their money. And that's a mistake. While you're at Rutgers, you should make it your job to get as much information and as many skills as you possibly can that way, you'll have those skills when you go out into the business world, and you deserve that. As a business professional, you should be aware of some current business trends. One trend is that we are becoming increasingly a service economy. Every year, proportionately more firms generate their income by doing things for their customers rather than by making things for their customers. Another trend is that we are becoming a global economy. That means that our firm competes with similar firms all around the world. 
not just in the neighborhood. To address this increased competition, we need to find ways to do things more quickly and more effectively. For example, many firms are now using what are called enterprise resource planning systems. An ERP is a computer program that connects all aspects of a firm and also connects the firm to its supply chain and to its customer base so that the firm can create strategies that will maximize profit and minimize costs. Another competitive strategy is for firms to embrace the global economy and become involved in e-commerce. This enables firms to buy equipment or materials or goods anywhere around the globe, advertise anywhere around the globe, and sell their products or services to anyone, anywhere. It's very expensive for a firm to have lots of inventory on hand for just in case they need it. Instead, many firms find that they can save money and save time by moving to a just-in-time inventory management system where they get the inventory that they need just in time to deliver it to their customers. We'll talk more about this system in a later chapter. Another way that firms can get competitive advantage is by moving to a total quality management system. Defects in products or services waste time and energy and disappoint customers. So a TQM system is designed to try to reduce errors to as close to zero as possible. Based on the material that we just discussed, large firms would use which of these systems to integrate all of their functions and data into a single system. Take a moment to think about it and hit pause if you need more time. The correct answer would be an enterprise resource planning system. Remember, TQM is total quality management, so its primary focus is quality, whereas just-in-time inventory focuses primarily on inventory management. Here's another question to think about. Today's business environment is characterized by which of these? That's right. Global competition, time-based competition, and a shift toward a service economy are all part of today's business environment. It may not always seem that firms care much about ethical behavior, but they should. If investors and creditors 
start to feel that a firm is behaving unethically, they will invest in the stocks and bonds of some other firm. And if they lose faith in the entire stock market, they can invest in other opportunities like real estate or gold bullion or wheat futures. So it's important for firms to hold high ethical standards if they want the continued participation of investors and creditors. The Institute of Management Accountants, or IMA, is the regulatory body for management accountants, and it has determined that there are four main components of ethical behavior for management accountants. Competence, confidentiality, integrity, and credibility. Competence means that management accountants need to have the skills to do the job that they are doing. In other words, we don't want bad management accountants who are going to make mistakes that lead to bad decisions by managers. Confidentiality means that management accountants need to keep the firm's secrets. In other words, management accountants are not allowed to reveal things about the firm's internal operations to outsiders. That would give the outsiders an unfair advantage. Integrity means that management accountants must be honest and fair in all of their dealings. And credibility means that management accountants must give reliable information, that is, information that managers and ultimately investors and creditors can rely on. An ethical dilemma in business occurs when you have the opportunity to do the wrong thing. For example, your boss says, listen, I need you to work overtime on this project so that we can get it done on time. But I don't want you to record the overtime because if you do, then our department will be over budget on this project. If you do me this favor, I'll remember it when it's time for promotions. So what do you do? The first step is to think about all of the stakeholders in this ethical dilemma. Who are all of the people colleagues at work, your boss, other supervisors, yourself, your family, who would be affected by the choice that you make. The second step is to consider firm policy. Look in the firm handbook to find out what it says about this kind of action. Finally, you should consult a supervisor. In this case, since it's your supervisor who's asking you to do the wrong thing, you should consult somebody else who can be your advisor. If the ethical problem is pervasive in the firm, then you may have to consult a lawyer. But it's better to find out what your options are and what the consequences might be before you make the decision to do the wrong thing. So here's a question to think about. 
a management accountant who avoids a conflict of interest is meeting which of these ethical standards? Confidentiality, competence, credibility, or integrity? Think about it for a moment. Having a conflict of interest would be the wrong thing to do. So by avoiding conflicts of interest, you are upholding the ethical standard of integrity. You're doing the right thing. This is the end of Chapter 16, Part 1.